many of our viewers have experienced uh, the same and had ex the same experiences. Well, this webcast is going to be a very long one, I suppose, because there is so much information that we have to bring here. And we don't want to hasty go through this information. There are quite sensitive data. Maybe some people feel that we are getting too personal. Maybe this is too touchy. But we just want to expose evil. We are not trying to, again, point finger and be judgmental toward anybody. And I just want to move on here with our webcast here. This is the wrong picture I have. This is, was supposed to be uh, the book Witchcraft Today from Gerald Gardner, which is a nonfiction book published in 1954. And uh, the book here, uh, Witchcraft Today recounts Garner's thoughts on the history and practices of the witch cult and his claim to have met practicing witches in 1930 in uh, England. And I'm just uh, going uh, downwards. Witchcraft Today is one of the foundational texts for the religion of Wicca, along with Garner's second book on the subject, The Meaning of Witchcraft. Now, uh, Will, you, I understand from our conversation that you have a deep knowledge about this book, about the starting point of this book, and as Gerald Gardner being kind of the father of witchcraft, of modern witchcraft that we know today. Yes, the modern witchcraft, also known as Wicca, or the craft, as it's sometimes called. It all started with Gerald Gardner. He was a British civil servant. He was part of the administration of the British Empire. He was serving in India. And when he was in India, he had access to gurus and the swamis and the different mystical teachings of Hinduism. And when he returned back to the United Kingdom, he wrote this book. If I'm not mistaken, I believe it was 19, yeah, 1954, he wrote this book, Witchcraft Today. Yeah. Now, somewhere a couple of years before he published that book, it, witchcraft was illegal under British law. It was actually mm. an, an offence to practice any kind of witchcraft. But those laws were repealed somewhere around 1951, and so maybe 52. And so Gerald Gardner was able for the first time to publicly publish a book on witchcraft. Now, researchers, especially um, uh, a, a researcher, I have his... Uh, research documents in front of me. Craig Hawkins, he's an apologist, uh, quite well known, a researcher into the occult. He did a lot of deep research into Gerald Gardner and where did he get his information from? Gardner himself claims that as a young man he came across an old existing covern or a group of witches that were practicing in southern England. It's possible he did, but all the information we have from the Middle Ages and, and from the Dark Ages seems to indicate that the witch, the ancient pagan witchcraft religion known as Wicca, was a very simple religion, nothing as complex as what you have with the witchcraft today, which was all introduced by Gerald Gardner. It was simply some rights to have a better crop, a better harvest in agriculture, and maybe some fertility rights. Maybe if you were married and you wanted children, but there were no children, you were just never getting pregnant. There could be some simple fertility rites that these Wiccans would practice, but it was a very, very simple religion. The best research that we have today seems to indicate 
that Gerald Gardner, like Carlos Castaneda, was a student of the occult. He was definitely involved in the Theosophical Society. He was well acquainted with the uh, daughter of Annie Besant, the uh, second leader of the Theosophical Society. He had access to ceremonial magic. He was a personal acquaintance of Aleister Crowley, the notorious occultist that had the title The Beast 666 and was proud of it. Um, Alistair Crowley launched uh, different occult organizations. He was involved in what is known as OTO, a major occult organization. He was involved in the Golden Dawn. He would often join these organizations and end up leading them. Uh, he was a very energetic practitioner of ceremonial magic. Um, he had the motto, do what thou wilt. Mm. In other words, whatever it is in your heart you want to do, you should do it. And Gerald Gardner knew these people. He studied the Western occultism, things like astrology, numerology, the Babylonian pagan religions, the Egyptian religions of Osiris and Isis, he had all this knowledge. And the best research seems to indicate that Gerald Gardner actually invented modern witchcraft, what we call neo-pagan witchcraft. He introduced elements from Babylonian occultism and Egyptian occultism. He introduced elements uh, from these theosophical teachings, from the Hindu religions, for example, reincarnation teachings were never part of the ancient Ke uh, Celtic practice of Wicca. They were never part of that. They were, it was a very simple, very simplistic religion. But Gerald Gardner introduces Hindu philosophical teachings, and he packages this as the modern witchcraft, what he called witchcraft today in this book that he published. And from this book, there were many students of Gardner. Uh, there were people from the United States came to visit Gardner and studied with him, and they were initiated into this witchcraft. Uh, Sybil Lee was uh, a, a witch that trained under Gardner and she emigrated to the United States and she was spreading this Gardnerian witchcraft here in the United States. But this this modern witchcraft is not really the very simplistic mm. uh, Dark Ages witchcraft that existed in Celtic cultures and, and prior to Christianity. There's a claim that these were the religions of Europe, the Celtic Europe, especially mm. prior to the introduction of Christianity. But what Gardner introduced was far more sophisticated. His ceremonial magic really derives from the ceremonial magic of Aleister Crowley. So you have this connection definitely between modern witchcraft and the traditional occult of the mm. Babylonian mystery religions they're deaf they're all packaged together it's 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 gardner's witchcraft really is uh, just simply a different packaging of the occult it's so, packaging it under yeah. the identity of neo-pagan witchcraft but it's the same energy manipulation uh, type of activity that that existed going all the way back to pagan Babylon and the sorcerers and magicians that right. Daniel had to face there. It's mm -hmm. the same type of religion, just repackaged under the, a Celtic identity. Well, it sounds quite satanic, but what is the link to Harry Potter? What is the link between Gardner's book and Gardner witchcraft today with Harry Potter? Where do you find well, the link? The, the, the essence of any kind of witchcraft is ceremonial magic. This is the idea that you can perform some kind of ritual and verbalize some kind of incantation and it will have power. Mm -hmm. there's, there's different kinds of ceremonial magic. You could uh, put 
paint circles on a floor or make a circle with candles and light mm -hmm. candles and then right. you walk in and out of this circle um there's lots of different types of of rituals out there but the, the common denominator is that there is a magical ritual or a magical formula called an incantation that you can recite or a ritual that you can practice and bingo something good is going to happen in your life it is going to produce healing it is going to produce answers to your problems it is going to take you out of financial distress and bring prosperity uh, if you're unemployed it's going to get you a job if you've got a job you don't like and you're looking for a better job the idea is you practice this ritual and somehow the energies are going to be manipulated and they're going to bring you what you're looking for you could be looking for a girlfriend or a boyfriend and there just hasn't been one that has appeared yeah. well the practitioner of witchcraft whether it's in harry potter's books or the real witchcraft of gerald gardner you practice some kind of ritual you repeat some kind of incantation and supposedly the energies in the universe will then bring you the girlfriend or the boyfriend that you're looking for bring you the job you're looking for bring you the healing whatever it is but these practices they're based on endeavoring to find solutions to problems all right well we've just and this is what harry potter described yeah. you know that's what harry potter does he's a lonely uh child and uh, yeah, you know, he okay. practices these rituals to improve his life. That's what they're for to we're bring gonna, success. We're going to actually show our viewers some of these links from the Harry Potter books. What we actually still doing here, we're trying to make to to create a bigger picture and to make our understanding better to bring all the information available as much as we can there is a lot of information we will not be able to bring all of it tonight but some of this information will bring it out here on the table we're putting out so our viewers can make their own decision you also mentioned uh silver ravenwolf's book tanwich here which i I'm, I'm reading here from the slide and I was actually, uh, during my research, I was looking on, on the net and found that this is actually uh, a kit, which is called a Teen Witch Kit, which is being sold today on Amazon. I don't know the price, but they put this uh, text on the kit. Here is everything the novice spellcaster needs to practice the craft of the wise and be a force for good. Step into the sacred space and discover the secret of one of the world's oldest mysteries, the art and science of white magic, gentle, loving practice. This is exactly what you just mentioned before, you know, being a force of good, uh, white magic and so on, oldest mystery, the kit box converts you into your own personal altar, all of the spells created especially for teens. So this is a product which is built on the book, which is called, I don't remember exactly, uh, the book is called... Mm, I have a copy of it. Oh, you uh, have it, right. right. The yeah, Teen yeah. Witch, yeah. okay. Teen and Witch, yeah, by... Obviously, it's, an, it's not a true author's name. Uh, Silver Ravenwolf is a pen name, but mm -hmm. it's the whole idea of... Uh, appealing to teenagers there's part of this occult ritual you can see what's known as the light circle mm -hmm. uh, the candles placed in kind of a circle um this is just one sample of yeah probably maybe. dozens maybe hundreds of books that are out there appealing to teenagers appealing to young children that if you practice these rituals if you repeat these incantations that your life will be a blessing that it'll mm. bring good into your life that's the mm. claim the reality is you're going to be come eventually slaves of demonic spirits it's All terrible right. it's the so, darkness is terrible so what we see here again we see common denominators we see energy is being mentioned as well here 
we see the word white magic. That's what we see. We see a circle of light. Okay, I just want to repeat these terminologies because we're going to later on, we, through our webcast and the next one, we're going to see them in Harry Potter's books. And these books are not secret. I mean, anyone can buy them, right? These books are not hiding that they are promoting witchcraft, are they? It's no longer occult. No. <laughs> the, these teachings used to be secret teachings. As I mentioned, until 1951, if I'm, it could be 52, it was illegal in the United Kingdom to practice any kind of witchcraft. Hmm. If uh, J.K. Rowling would have attempted to publish her books uh, yeah. uh, in, in those days, she would have been taken up in front of a judge and thrown in prison or very heavily fined. It was illegal. Now it's no longer occult. It, mm. It's it's out in the open, no so longer it, secret, it's, no it longer has, hidden. It has become a product. Amazon.com is selling it. Anyone can get in touch with evil spirits anytime, anywhere. This is basically what has become today. So spiritism, being a witch, being part of this occult world has become mainstream. You can buy kits and as actually uh, they're uh, promoting here, I, I think they're saying here with step-by-step -step instructions and clear magical symbols, the spells are easy to perform. And I took off the text actually, if you go on Amazon and look anywhere, anytime, this is how they uh, promote this product. Do you have anything yeah. to add uh, on this book before we move you on? You know, I don't think I, I need to add anything. It's blatant for everyone yes. to see yeah. our society, yeah. our culture, mm. our civilization is now becoming oriented to the occult. The occult is being accepted as mainstream as mm. part of our life. And it, it's the yeah. same within the areas of intimacy, Intimacy now, what is forbidden in the Bible, is now be has become mainstream. We are, unfortunately, in a post-Christian culture. It does appear that Satan and his evil angels are taking control of our secular world. It's tragic. But the Bible prophesies this would happen. Exactly. Any student of the Bible should not be surprised. It, mm -hmm. Jesus warned about these last days, that there would be this evil there will be this spiritualism, there will be demons masquerading as angels of light, and that the masses of people are going to be deceived. Mm. Uh, I, I thank God that I was rescued from this terrible deception. You know, I was uh, an occultist, I was a practicer of these rituals and incantations, and I believed in sincerity that I was working for God. The, the spirit I was following was from the true God that created the heavens and the earth. But I was deceived, and so many people are now being deceived by this paraphernalia that you can acquire on Amazon. It's uh, tragic, but it's right. a real world, and we need mm -hmm. to confront it. And I'm sitting here with this book here, even if it's in Danish here. This is the Great Controversy book. And there are two major chapters uh, in, Dan in Danish. It's actually chapter... 31 and, and 32 here, which is describing mostly exactly what is happening today. Mm -hmm. What are we going through all these books here? This is actually what this book is uh, describing. So anyone here... And I was rescued. Uh, Michael, I was rescued from material written in that book. I did not wow. actually read Great Controversy itself. I read another book that narrated material from the great controversy. And this is what yeah. rescued me from that terrible deception. Praise, praise the Lord. Praise God about this year. So any one of our viewers located in Scandinavia, if you'd like to have a copy of this book, you can contact us at Light Channel and we will send it to you uh, free of charge. Uh, no further obligations. But let's move on. Uh, actually, we are half away. <laughs> uh, through this webcast, we still have some information. I still have some questions for you here. These are, this is the collection here. These are the seven books in this occult correct, uh, collection 
uh, of Harry Potter, written by J.K. Rowling uh, in, I believe, about 10 years. So I'm not going to, to mention all of these titles here. Uh, our viewers can, can see them on the screen here. Uh, there is no real reason why we would mention here. Just want to emphasize that uh, we have done our homework and we know the background of these books here. Uh, we have read uh, not all of them, just partially some of these uh, of these books here, and we're basing information, our informations and our conclusions, comparing with the Bible, comparing with other books, comparing it what it said, per definition, what is being written in these books. This is how we are doing our research here at Light Channel and with our guests such as uh, Will uh, Barron. And also, before we go further, I would like to remind our at least Christian viewers, what God has said in his word about sorcery and magic, which is part of the occult package, the occult agenda. And I'm not going to read all of the Bible verses here. If I can change here, there it comes. If you want to go online, this is a very good tool here online. It's Knowing Jesus. You can go and uh, you can search but there are many other uh, interesting websites, good tools of the websites. And what you will find here, you will actually find 33 Bible verses which covers this uh, topic about sorcery and magic. And you will see some of the first one, Revelation 18.23, uh, Zechariah 10.2, and so on and so on. And there is... No doubt, if you read the Bible, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, there should be no doubt in your mind that this is totally against God's will, at least the God of the Bible. And could you emphasize a, a little bit on this uh, will, if you will? Yeah, let me just quote the pertinent scripture, if you don't mind. And yeah. uh, also, I want to make a comment about the titles of your book. Um, in the publishing world, sometimes in one country, uh, uh, even within an English-speaking country, the title may be different. The title of the first book in the United Kingdom, it was published as Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. But in the United States, this is the version I have, it was retitled Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. For whatever reason, the publisher... Uh, publisher is the one that selects the title. Ultimately, they have control over what goes on the cover. Uh, in the publisher in the United Kingdom, by using Philosopher's Stone, they wanted to make the title more conservative, more acceptable, perhaps to the Christianity of the United Kingdom. But in the United States, their publishers there, they said, "No, we can. We don't. We don't have to hide this. This is." We can tell it what it is. This is the sorcerer's stone. These are books uh, on sorcery. The main uh, scripture that we have that warns about witchcraft is actually found in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9. And I'm going to read it. This is taken from Moses when he was with the Israelites. They were about to enter into the promised land. And God spoke through Moses to the children of Israel. And God said this, when you enter the land, the Lord your God is giving you, that's the promised land, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. So the Israelites were not to imitate some of these occult pagan practices of the people that were living in that land of Canaan. And it says there, let, verse 10, let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery. Uh, that word sorcery there is the same thing as witchcraft. Some Bible versions call it witchcraft, like the uh, New American Standard Bible, for example. Interprets omens engages in witchcraft or casts spells or who is a medium or spiritist or who consults the dead. So there's a whole list there. And 
what the new age spirituality movement is doing what it's practicing is exactly what is on this list and it says there anyone who does these things is detestable to the lord the lord god the creator of the heavens and the earth knows that these practices are coming from satan from lucifer from the evil one from the the great archangel of evil and all his angels with him they're the ones that are introducing these practices because it enables satan to control people through these practices so god says there anyone who does these things is detestable to the lord and because of these detestable practices the lord your god will drive out those nations before you you must be blameless before me very clear scripture tells us that god does not want us to be practicing witchcraft sorcery wicca astrology numerology mediumship channeling communicating with spirit beings god does not want us to practice those things because they these things come from satan and they are detestable in god's sight Can you hear me well? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't hear you. F uh, All right. Since I read from scripture, your audio was gone. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. <laughs> and I didn't okay. know what to do about it. I thought, well, maybe the it's Strange. picking it up, but we're no, not no, live, I, so you can always I, edit uh, this out. I don't even remember it. I, I came to. I need to make a note on this year, where to to cut. Uh, obviously, I did put my microphone on mute <laughs> because my uh, my camera here went on standby for some reason, and I had to go off and turn it on. Okay, so we are okay. I will have to look so in, uh, in the video. Do you need to re-record what you were saying after after I finished reading from Deuteronomy 18? Do you need to re-record what you were saying, or is it did it re? Did it pick up on your? Um, no, I don't think it didn't pick up on the recording, of course, because the microphone okay. was off. But was uh, mute. Yeah, me, yeah. Let me see here. Okay, was well, I was saying something about these Bible verses? Okay, so I will just put a black screen on, so I know where to cut. All right, so we were just reading from all, all these Bible verses, and you mentioned some of them well. And uh, we had them here on our uh, slide here. I will just uh, I will try to put a, a full screen again here so uh, our reader can, can see it. Oh, that was the wrong mouse. I'm uh, 
working on. I have three mouses here, <laughs> no cat. But so here it is. Uh, if you go to this website here, as I mentioned before, you will, you will be able to search sorcery and magic, and you will come up with 33 Bible verses that is explaining exactly the will of God and that God in the Bible the, is forbidden. The Bible is forbidding uh, this kind of, of practices. So what we're trying to say is that there is no connection whatsoever. There is no mingling. We cannot actually do any intercession. You know, uh, There is no compatibility between these occult practices and being a Christian. Um, is that correctly your view as well? Absolutely. Well? Yeah. I mean, it's like oil and water. They don't mix. It's mm -hmm. like black and white. They, mm -hmm. it, they, you cannot mix paganism. The Israelites, historically, they tried to do that. Even King Solomon was involved in pagan practice through the influence of his wives. But God, throughout the whole of the Old Testament, is very clear we cannot be involved in these pagan religion practices. We cannot be. We must move away from them, keep away from them. It's very important. Mm, all right. Well, the publishing industry has never seen anything quite like this, as we mentioned before. And anyone could go in and search online, and you will find that the Harry Potter books has probably been the most sold books, some of the most sold books ever compared to the Bible. And I have been, again, as you mentioned before, we, you mentioned already about uh, Norway becoming a bestseller. But what is the fascination, Will? This is a, a question. What is the fascination with these books and, and the movies as well? Why are so many children and adults being drawn to these books? Because there have always been movies and about witchcraft and fiction books, again about witchcraft, wizardry, and sorcery, but none of them have ever obtained this kind of popularity. And anyone could go in and search online. None of these books that we've mentioned before have obtained the popularity that we've seen, we are seeing uh, in these books, Harry Potter. So what is so different with this line of books? Why are they so much more popular than anything else that has ever been written? Well, Michael, I think the first issue we must keep in mind is that, especially in Europe, we are in a post-Christian culture. In my former home country of the United Kingdom, I think church attendance is something like 5% of the population attend five. church on a regular basis, five, something like that. It's very low, um, at, at least on a weekly basis, mm. very low indeed. Now, in the 1940s, 1950s, Christianity was still a very popular religion within the United Kingdom. So you had a certain measure of protection that, families go to church, families read the Bible, mm. they know what scripture teaches. But since Charles Darwin and his theories of evolution became very popular, almost the default teaching on the origin of mankind, and we have seen the decline in a, re a religious practice of Christianity, and Jesus predicted this, he said in the last days, the love of many will go, grow cold. The faith will decline. Uh, because we don't have a strong Christian presence now, certainly in, in Europe, uh, it, it, there's nothing then to stop children reading this stuff. There are no parents out there mm. saying, don't read this. There's no one issuing a warning about it. I mean, we're warning about it, but we're very conservative Christians. And, and I believe also that Satan and his evil angels have inspired this material. As I mentioned earlier, you read how J.K. Rowling got these ideas. It was almost like these ideas were implanted in her mind. Uh, Satan and his evil angels are masterminds. Uh, they know where culture is at. 
They know human psychology. They know that many children live empty lives. You know,、mm. we, children don't have religion in their lives anymore. So they're looking for something that will give them interest, that will、mm. give them、uh, fulfillment in life. They're not going to find it in the secular world so easily, and so. Uh, you have a market. You have、uh, children there that are ready for this material. You've got Satan that has inspired it. Satan knows what these children are going to be fascinated with. I believe he inspired these writings.、Uh, uh, J.K. Rowling, I'm sure, is a brilliant、mm. fiction writer too. You'd have to be a brilliant writer to have this、mm. kind of success. And I think. Also, Satan and his evil angels are inspiring children to buy this stuff.、Mm. You know, it, it's on multi-level marketing, if you will, on many, many levels. Satan has is inspiring children to read this material, to understand it, and Satan and his evil angels will then give the children. An interest or a fascination to want to go beyond、mm. the fiction of Harry Potter and turn to the real witchcraft of Gerald Gardner and all the th- hundreds of authors that are out there, like Silver Ravenwolf and、mm. Teen Witch. That's the so, next step.、Mm. So, since Christianity has left society, since Christianity has left Europe mostly and the Western world, there is a gap. There is a huge gap.、Mm. And、yes, sa- a spiritual and, vacuum. Exactly, and what is actually happening here, as you are saying, Satan, of course, he knew by working through Darwinism and other philosophies that ideologies that we're going to cover shortly, he's actually filling the gap here because the emptiness in people's life, they're trying to fill that gap. This is what we're seeing、exactly. today. Exactly. This is one、yes. of the explanations,、uh, right?、Uh, we have here. Yes. Now, And、right. no, ma- no matter how entertainment intensive、mm. our culture is,、uh, there is still the human problem of emptiness of purpose in life.、Mm. Uh, people still get sick,、mm-hmm. you know. Even though we may have prosperity, we all have cars and televisions. We have smartphones and. Uh, we've got many luxuries in our lives that we would never have had a hundred years ago. But the reality is, we still get sick and we need healing.、Mm. We still can feel lonely, and、mm. we need some kind of blessings in our lives, some kind of fulfillment. And of course, the young people and older adults, adults read Harry Potter. It's、mm. not just the teens that buy、yeah. this stuff.、Mm. Adults read this, and and of course, they then. Are fascinated by the occult, and they start turning to the occult for solutions to the problems that they face. Yeah, and and but isn't it so well? And also, that's your experience, as you have been explaining before. Even if we as adults, even adults, even if we as Christian, we are living Christianity, and we leave this behind, and we're trying to fill the gap with entertainment. At the end of the road, as you mentioned, we still get sick. We still get lonely. We are still, and I'm sure a lot of people are still feeling the emptiness, the meaningless of life. The questions, the major questions of life, are not being answered by filling that gap, that hole, that abysses with Satan's philosophy, with these ideologies. Even if people. Let's say secular people see this as just entertainment. This is just fun. You know, we we don't care about a cult. We don't care about whatever ideology is behind. We just care to have a short-term entertainment. But when when you switch off, you know, your TV or your computer or your YouTube, that emptiness is still there. Isn't that your experience as well? Yeah, and that's why people are motivated to then investigate to the real world of the occult to go beyond the fiction into the non-fiction. Yes,、mm-hmm. and Satan knows that very well, and this is why he's he's、yes. using this kind of you know stepwise ideologies.、Mm-hmm. You know, starting with entertainment and pushing people further and further、yes. away from God and closer and closer to to Him until. 
you get trapped. That's, yes. That's the idea, you know, that's the, now. Yes. We mentioned exactly. that one of the occult ideologies found in pagan religions is called animism. And I'm going to put up here a slide and the definition, which you can find all over a, a lot of places on Internet, is animism. The definition is that a spirit, spirits or life force inhabits all creatures and nature, sometimes inanimate objects as well. And if you could, well, just based on your experience and knowledge, just give a short description of where do we find what religions do we find this ideology or what philosophies apart from Harry Potter? Where do we find this idea, this philosophy of life force being in all creature natures, even in objects? Well, you find it in the Hindu religion mm -hmm. uh, where you will have amulets or teraphim, uh, objects that supposedly will have mystical power as i mentioned earlier crystals and crystal healing it's even popular in our secular culture people might wear certain rings that they believe will bring good luck uh, they may wear a pendant that they believe will bring healing uh, that will bring good luck or protect them from danger uh, people will have jewelry dangling from their car rear view mirror mm. a pendants or jewelry in the idea that this will protect them from danger uh, this uh, would even include crosses if you could mm. if you're from a christian yeah. culture you may have a cross mm. dangling from your neck on a chain that you think is going to bring protection from mm. evil or uh, you could have a cross dangling from your rear view mirror in the car these are many examples of, in a sense, animism in practical areas of our life that uh, you think because of this object, you're going to get some divine blessing or some divine protection. And if I may add, we do also find it in the Catholic Church, the Catholic religion and the Orthodox Church. They do have very strong. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And there is a long list. We know that there is a, a strong belief in the Catholic religion, in the Catholic Church, for example. I don't know. I don't remember the terminology in English, but praying to Mary, praying to saints, mm. praying to yeah. relics. You know, there is a lot of relics around the world. Yes. Which people yes. are praying to if you go to portugal there is in fatima there is in serbia there is in of course in vatican but many other locations around the world you have these relics which people are praying to and also similar we find it in the orthodox church we are not just claiming this uh, this is uh, something which is searchable anyone can can read about this so this is animism where you find spirit or a life force where in the Catholic Church and the Orthodox, the belief is that God, or there is some kind of holy sacredness or holy power into either the water, which we find in the Eucharist, because this is what is happening. Yes, yes. Right? Okay, yes. The, the oblate, which the priest believes, which is also, per definition, an occult practice. You know, the priest actually is transforming that's where the word comes, transubstantiation comes from. I hope I said it right. It's a difficult word. Transubstantiation, yes. yes. And as, as you know, as an English uh, person, but people have been burned at stake for refusing to take part exactly from this process. So this is where we find this occult practice coming from Pagan religions, yes, they came from before Christianity. This is a pagan practice which has been kind of baptized into Christianity through the Catholic Church, and we find it in the Orthodox Church. Any uh, comments, additional comments on this? I, th I think you said it perfectly. I think the ultimate mm. example of animism is the Eucharist mm. and the claim that the wafer, a mm. physical object, becomes because of the act of the priest because of a mm. ceremony or an invocation of the priest this becomes the literal 
flesh of Jesus and that mm. the wine becomes the literal blood of mm. Jesus. This is a classic example of mm. pagan animism, the idea that some physical object can mm. take on mystical power that it can be used for good, for a blessing. Mm. And we're not just saying that because we're not anti-Catholic. Catholic, this is actually anti-biblical. There is nowhere in the Bible, not one single verse, pointing us as Christians to practice such a thing or to partake in the Eucharist as being part of our uh, relationship to God or our salvation, just to uh, point uh, that out. But now, what does it have to do with Harry Potter? You know, people are saying, well, it seems that the conversation is moving away from Harry Potter. Well, it has to do with Harry Potter, because here I have some quotes, and I have uh, just found one, two, three, four, where we have uh, conversation from the Harry Potter books. It's book one, two, four. Uh, you have the, the page number here, and... Uh, Let's take uh, the second quote here from book two, page 312. I decided to leave behind a diary preserving my 16-year-old self in its pages. Okay, some people may argue, well, that's just fiction. Let's take the next one. It was a map showing every detail of the Hogwarts castle and ground, but a truly remarkable thing were the teeny ink dots moving around it each labeled with a name in a minuscule writing. And the last one, Dumbledore, which is a character in the book, reached inside it and pulled out a large, roughly hewn wooden cup. It would have been entirely unremarkable had it not been full to the brim with dancing blue-white flames. So, well, <clears throat> is it difficult? Is it quite obvious, just based on these few codes we have just read here, that animism is one of the occult philosophies promoted through these books? Oh, yeah, it, it's a foundation. It's a foundation mm. of witchcraft or the mm. Celtic Wicca religion, the, uh, the idea of objects mm. having power, mm. uh, mystical powers that you can use for benefit, for blessing, mm. it, it, it's, it, it is a foundation of witchcraft, absolutely. Mm. Mm. And you can actually, you can see that uh, the, through the whole, uh, I believe they made the eighth movie of, of Harry Potter, even as far as I know, there are only seven books. I don't know what the eighth movie is all about. I don't they know they split, one of the books was split into two all movies. Right. So that's, that's the reason. Um, I, didn't, I decided not to take any clips from these movies. I believe all these movies are very occult, and there are a lot of scenes which are quite occult in these movies, but I would recommend you, our viewers, if you haven't seen yet, there is a very good uh, ministry, there is a very good channel, which is called Little Light Studios. If you go on their channel, they have done some very interesting studies on also Harry Potter's, as well as other, a lot of other Hollywood movies where they actually emphasize by showing the clips from the movies and linking them to exactly what we are uh, talking about it today. So that was Little Eye Studios. If you, want, if you really want to see the links to, into uh, these, uh, these movies. And if we move on here, there is another uh, philosophy which uh, I would like to uh, emphasize here. But before we go there, I just had a couple of questions here. And if you could em emphasize, is there any danger for Christian, first of all, for Bible-believing Christian, is there any dangers related to enemies? So if, if a Christian falls into this occult practice or by ignorance doesn't really know what is the danger into falling into this practice because as we mentioned before we have millions of catholics and orthodox people around the world which does practice this 
on a daily basis, every Sunday almost. Well, Michael, I, I don't personally know where you can draw the line. Mm. Uh, a sincere Christian that ha has a neck chain with a cross on it, mm. is are they practicing animism? Um, I mean, if they believe that that physical gold cross or wooden cross has mystical power, they are. Mm. But if that cross is just a symbol of their dedication. For example, Moses himself told the Israelites that they should put uh, the commandments, the Ten Commandments, uh, uh, on their forehead. Uh, mm. And Orthodox Jews, literally, in some of their worship, will put this little container on the forehead, uh, hang it from their, their hat, uh, with a, a miniature copy of the Ten Commandments on it, or the Torah, the scroll of the Torah. Uh, you know, how far do you go before it, it, it enters the danger field? I cannot answer that for individual people. Mm. But God tells us that these practices are detestable. Each person uh, needs to pray to God that they will be receiving the light of scripture shining brightly each of us has to make our own decisions we, we have to pray for wisdom and discernment the danger is there i mean no question but just you know if you have a, a picture of jesus on the wall and and that could be somebody could class that as an icon and say that it is dangerous i don't know if i'd want to go that far mm, uh, right. but absolutely we should not be involved in in witchcraft or wicca but some of these issues are gray areas we have to pray for discernment and i'm, I'm certainly not the one to make judgments for other people we have to be aware of the danger of attaching power to an object even if the object happens to be a cross there is a danger that that cross itself can take on power and be a form of idolatry. Mm. It's the cross itself is not the power. It's what that cross means. It's the exactly. suffering mm. and death of our Lord Jesus Christ as an mm. atoning sacrifice. That is where the power, the shed blood of Jesus, the power is not in a piece of wood or mm. a piece of gold in mm. the form of a cross. So or we have to have discernment. Yeah. Hmm. And, right. you, you know, we don't we want to avoid fanaticism, too. You know, some people can be fanatical about things. They could see someone wearing a, a, a gold cross on a neck chain and, and disown that person or condemn them and, and do harm by doing that. We well, have to we have to really be discerning. Exactly. But if I may add that one of the dangers I would think of is that Satan is trying to fool us and to do kind of a transition. Like you mentioned before, some of the Orthodox Jews will take the container with a, a small copy of, of the Ten Commandments. So instead of emphasizing the spirit of the Bible, the spirit and the meaning of the cross, we are transforming that into a ritual, ritualistic religion. So we pray to yeah. a cross. You know, I happen to come from an Orthodox country, so these people will just pass a church building and will make the course, you know, the cross sign. And there is a belief that that will actually count as a prayer and God will be with you by just doing a traditional cross sign or just by wearing a cross, you know, so you are actually transponding something which is supposed to be spiritual to an object and isn't that what we also find in islam a lot among a lot of muslims where they're transponding actually the meaning let's say the spiritual side of the religion to actual ritualistic traditions where you find the ramadan and some other rituals and that by definition we are losing the true meaning actually of christianity which is obeying by spirit by heart ten commandments should be part of our life 
of our character of our, it, and it's not just a book that we hang on our forehead. Well, the last topic I would like to cover tonight uh, before we finish the first uh, part of this webcast is dualism and polarity. And a lot of people probably never heard about this, but this is the belief in two equal opposing forces. And as we go forth, I'm sure a lot of people, Christian, are going to recognize it. Because this is a belief in two forces which appear opposite but are actually complementing each other. This is the belief that opposing forces are complementing and necessary to each other is sometimes termed polarity. Good and evil or other opposites may also be seen as part of each other as are, or as mirrors of each other. So before we, we take the quotes from Harry Potter's books, where I found actually this occult philosophy, I'd like you to, Will, if you could just cover shortly, how do you see the link between dualism and polarity, new age, occult practices? We mentioned a little bit before uh, that in, there is no evil, there is no Satan. And but evil is being still accepted, right, in New Age philosophy. Well, Michael, we, we must realize, too, that New Age philosophy is not truth. It is error. And sometimes within the New Age movement, there are idiosyncrasies within their own teachings. There are competing teachings within New Age. There are some themes that are very common, like a foundational theme is that Satan does not exist. Uh, pretty much all New Agers hmm. uh, hold to that teaching, whether you're from Wicca or whether you're from uh, different Hindu groups. Uh, there's, there's a a consistent teaching satan doesn't exist that evil is just a matter of ignorance now in this concept of dualism itself some new age groups teach dualism and some don't uh, new age is primarily based upon hindu philosophy from the hindu religion and even in the hindu religion you will have dualists and you'll have non-dualists um, the Chinese medicine system, the idea of yin and yang, uh, teaches dualism, this concept of polar opposites, light and dark. And of course, the emphasis is that darkness isn't necessarily evil or necessarily satanic. It just is a counterbalance to light. And that, t for example, if we had... Uh, all darkness, you can't see anything. But mm. if everything was white, for example, if there was no color, but everything was white, like a white sheet of paper, vision wouldn't be much use to you anyway. Mm. In order for you to read a book, you have to read the black ink on the white paper, paper. or mm. on a computer screen, the reverse sometimes. So I, I personally don't, have a whole lot of passion about dualistic uh, philosophies. In some areas, you will get some extremist teachings in which perhaps some occultists may say, well, darkness and evil is also good. Mm. Uh, th th that, I, I think, is very evil. Very, that is beyond deception. Uh, just like black magic is evil it is harmful it is someone attempting to use incantations and rituals for evil purposes to want to put a curse on people to want to make other people sick uh to want to even have someone die i mean that is like gross evil but mm. most new agers are not involved in that i i wish i could be uh, more enlightening, if you will, on dualism. But I find it's one of those wishy-washy areas where I think even in reality, there is dualism. There is a reality of dualism. As I mentioned, you can't read a printed 
sheet of paper without the ink being black mm. and the paper white or vice versa. So dualism is part of nature. I think it, it is. But then some New Agers and some philosophical groups take it to extremes in which it becomes even dangerous. But if we bring it to the Bible, do we find any dualism in terms of a mixture between good and evil? Because isn't that a philosophy also behind Ying and Yang, that there has to be a balance between good and evil? This is uh, the philosophy. Yeah. You know? Do we find that in the Bible, is there any interconnection or com compatibility as we know as Seventh-day Adventists that there is no mixture between light and darkness. So That's when, right, yes. Yeah. When Satan comes into the picture and he's obviously open for truth, at least partially. This is one of his best methods of deception. Satan is open for part of truth, to accept that into his real, into his world. That's that's why people are being deceived, right? That's yes, yeah, absolutely, yes, mm -hmm. yeah, and and that's that's the real danger I would see with dualists because people do not see the dangers in mixing darkness and occult practices, as we will read here from the Harry Potter books, which are not just entertaining, because. By reading, by seeing, as the Bible is saying, you and I become changed. So even if we call it entertainment, by watching these movies, by reading these books, we will change eventually, either for good or either for bad. So if we have these comments here, let's take some of these quotes from uh, Harry Potter, let's say book number one. Uh, it's written here, it so happened that the phoenix whose tail feather is in your one gave another feather just one another. It is very curious indeed that you should be destined for this one when its brother, why its brother gave you that score. I think we must expect great things from you, Mr. Potter. After all, he who must not be named did great things. Terrible, yes, but great. And I just want to stop here, Will, because there is something in the, the reason I took this quotation. Who do you think is this he who must not be named? Who is that priest entity which is being mentioned here? <laughs> Isn't that I, quite I obvious? do see... Yeah. yeah, I do see what you're saying there, Michael. Uh, how dualism, how, now that you present an example... Um, is portrayed in Harry Potter. In other words, they're basically saying that evil is sometimes good. Mm. And um, I, I don't think it, it, it's just not a, a very common philosophy in the occult that I was involved in. I came from the theosophical mm. society background, the Alice Bailey teachings. Um, in those teachings, there was not a strong emphasis on dualism. It was there. It definitely was yeah. there. Um, I, I, we have to admit, even though within Christianity, you can be sick and that can bring you to God. Mm. <laughs> um, you know, you can experience a negative situation. Your wife walks out on you or your husband walks out of you. And that situation can bring you to God. Mm. Uh, you know, that could be an example of dualism, how evil somehow works for good. Uh, you think of Job, mm. you know, Job was subject to some terrible misadventure, but it was all in God's, mm. you know, yeah, I think you do find, I think actually you will probably find there is some dualism in the Bible. What I what I'm very nervous about is the dualism that you sometimes find, for example, in the Catholic Church, whereby the body is sometimes segregated or separated from the spirit. And you might have an example where a Catholic priest even mm. will drink alcohol and say, well, you know, I need the alcohol 
because my body needs to be relaxed and taken care of. And that alcohol will mm. take care of my body. But in my spirit, I'm studying scripture or studying mm. the catechisms. And that takes care of the spirit. Now, that kind of dualism, I really have a problem with there. Uh, we are a whole person. We are a unity. We can't neglect the body and expect that the mind will function well. You know, if you don't take care of the body, ultimately your your mind is not going to be as sharp as what it ought to be. So mm. I, I I'm I I guess I'm I'm absolutely not a follower of dualism, and I can see the dangers of that. Yeah. we are yeah. a whole person. And I totally agree with you. And a good point from the Bible that there is a form of dualism which is being promoted by God through His prophets in the Bible. But to redefine that maybe, or to define that even better, is that that dual is that we see in the Bible is because God is the ultimate force, good, love, yes. and the absolute truth that is able to turn the evil into something good. But what yes. Satan is using here, what he's saying through these books, through the dualism and polarity which we find within the occult practices is that we should accept evil on different levels or maybe in the yin and yang philosophy we should accept as much evil as good as being part of who we are as being part of our reality and this is the false let's say dualism if we take the bible dualism this is satanic because God will never accept that. Isn't that what the Bible is said so? Yeah. God will I never so. yes. work with Satan in common whatsoever. He never did. Well, he had dialogues with Satan. I don't know if he's still in dialogue somehow with Satan, but we know from the Bible that he had, he did have dialogue. Jesus, when he walked here on this planet, he had a dialogue with Satan. But Jesus and God, did he ever use any force, any evil in particular to bring something good? And I know some of our viewers will argue, yes, he did in the past, if you read the Old Testament, so and so. But that's a, that's a, a, a full, you know, a full other webcast a, a topic and, and of a conversation. We're just trying to focus here on the dualist being presented in the Harry Potter books compared to uh, to the Bible. And I just, uh, the last one I want to bring up here is from Lord Voldemort, uh, which said, I'm like him. Strange likeness, he said. And this is uh, the character being uh, presented uh, in the movie where uh, Lord Voldemort uh, is being supposed to be crying. And as you see here, this is a very occult kind of, uh, you know, show off because he's not crying here. Anyone can see that, right? This is how they depicted uh, Lord Voldemort crying. This is, in my view, this is a demonic uh, laugh, right? Okay. Do you have any comments on this, uh, uh, Will? You know, I have I have not seen the movies. I've not seen trailers <laughs> of them. Yeah, and I want to uh, move on from it's, this. It uh, be, it, it's it kind of scary, yeah. Yeah, scary. Hmm. All right. Well, uh, there is one thing I want to mention. We're going to split this webcast in, in two parts. Uh, it has been over two hours anyway, so that's uh, not a problem. Because you mentioned uh, the uh, theof theosophic movement which came and I want to to bring up here and it is related to Harry Potter the founder of the Christian science movement Mary Baker Eddy was one of the first to teach that immortality of the soul and the innate deity of humanity and this is where we find again the links to Harry Potter in her book science and health with a key to the scripture Eddie mingles the age-old principles of Gnosticism, pantheism, Hinduism, and dualism with Christian concepts. And this is where we find the mixture, the twin satanic lies spoken in Eden 
are reiterated in her writings. A few statements from her book should Sufis to demonstrate her position. And again, we find here, evil has no reality. It is neither person, place, nor thing, but it is simply a belief, an illusion of material sense. Soul is the divine principle of man, never sins, hence the immortality of the soul. So there is no sin according to the, the theology. Man and woman as coexistent and eternal with God forever reflect in glorified equality the infinite father, mother God. Let us remember that harmonious and immortal man has existed forever. And the last one, the death, an illusion, the lie of life in matter, any material evidence of death is false for it contradicts the spiritual fact of being. And Jesus, the highest corporeal concept of the divine idea, rebuking and destroying error and bringing the light to uh, light man's mortality. Now, well, as a former New Age priest, by reading this quotation, from this book, Science, Health, with a Creed to Scripture by Eddie. We, what do you see here? Well, Mary Baker Eady was a student of an occultist and a passionate uh, studier of Hindu scriptures and Western occultism. His name was Pineus Parkhurst Kimbe. And... Uh, Kimbe introduced Hindu philosophical teachings and combined them with Christian teachings. Hence, Mary Baker Eady launches this organization called Christian Science. Mm. But in this version of Christianity, you have incorporated the Hindu philosoph philosophical teachings, the immortality, uh, ideas on reincarnation, uh, very, very early form this of, of the New Age philosophies and teachings. There were actually three different groups that were produced uh, through the ministry, if you could call it, that of Pineus Parker's Kimbe. There was Christian Science, Mary Baker Ede, and then the Church of Religious Science by a man, Ernest Holmes, that was another uh, student of Kimbe. And then you've got also the Unity School of Christianity. These three organizations were the very first, what I would call Christian New Age churches. These were organizations that didn't pretend or didn't reveal themselves to be occult. They, their identity was Christian but they were introducing Hindu philosophical teachings into their Christianity. Mm -hmm. And this is, yeah, it, it, this bridges over to the Wicca witchcraft. You've got mm -hmm. the, the similar philosophies in witchcraft as what you find in, in this Christian science. So what we can conclude here is that because, just because it's labeled Christianity, it doesn't mean that it's Christian. That's one thing. Right. That's right. And it's not true Christian. It's a mixture. It, right. it is a mixture of mm -hmm. Christianity using a lot of Christian language, Christian identity, mm -hmm. but incorporating teachings from the pagan Hindu religion, more, more so paganism. I, I don't think Christian science people are going to be into traditional Western occultism, things like astrology, mm. numerology, tarot cards. That mm. was not part of their heritage. Their heritage was more the, the Hindu teachings uh, that came through Pineus Parker's Kimbe. But, but these are deceptive teachings. Yeah. They're, they're, we, we do find... And, and they're, they're, I see them as part of New Age. I, I, uh, some people that go to Christian science churches, they may not identify themselves as new agers in the modern sense, but the teachings definitely have similarities. Hmm. Yes. Well, if, if we just take this, for example, that death is an illusion, the life mm. of life in matter, 
isn't that what we find in many Christian denominations today? This is one of the strongest beliefs in many Christian denominations, the immortality of the soul, which has been introduced here into Christianity from pagan religions, which has been one of Satan's major lies from the very beginning. You shall not die. You will not die. Isn't that what we yeah. actually see being kind of reincarnated, renewed, maybe repackaged into modern Christianity, maybe modern New Age? And we see that also in Wicca practices. We, see, we find this also in Harry Potter books. So even if Satan, maybe because he thinks that people like us are exposing his lies and over the time he's repackaging his lies. That's right. Make, trying to make it maybe more complex, more fanciful, more attractive. Isn't that what we're actually seeing here? Also through Harry yeah. Potter well, books. Yeah, what you're seeing is really a westernization of core Hindu philosophy and teachings. Hinduism believes in the immortality of the soul, that the soul lives indefinitely, it reincarnates over and over again, but it never actually dies as such. And you're seeing in Christian science, yes, this, this introduction of Hindu teachings, which are pagan. This is paganism, core yeah. paganism. You're seeing it introduced into Christianity. Mm -hmm. Again, I believe this is all part, Christian science and the work of Pinius Parker's Kimby, it's all part of this satanic conspiracy for Satan wants to dilute Christianity where he sees Christianity he says, well, I'm going to dilute it. I'm going to bring paganism concepts into it, but they're disguised as philosophies. It's not blatant paganism. Christian science people are not out there worshipping idols of Shiva, Vishnu or uh, Ganesha or Brahma, I mean, they're not, but the philosophy, the philosophical concepts, this is a mortality, the animism idea that objects have spiritual power and value. This is what Satan brings in to try to water down hmm. uh, Christianity. Absolutely. Hmm. Well, I hope for our viewers that we have not been too confusing. We have tried to bring to the table here a lot of information now the video is going to be on youtube for as long as god allows that i know satan is very angry at being exposed especially on youtube and we god knows when in the future even our channel is going to to be taken down but for as long as god will allow this video is going to be available on youtube and all this information is going to be available in this video. And if you have any question, please do ask. There is a comment below. We will try to do our best if you have questions in regards to this presentation or any other presentation, we'll invite you. Please do comment, please do ask questions. We'll be more than happy and I know also will if there are questions related to these subjects that uh, Will has uh, covered today and previous webcasts, please do ask uh, questions. And again, Will, we are going to continue our debate in regards to these issues, because I believe that there is a need to examine more critically this conflict between Christ and Satan, between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Not only has the leader of darkness attacked the human race in a blatant, open-handed fashion, as evidenced throughout our webcast and other sinister occult demonstration, but he has succeeded in planting his banner of death even within the walls of the Christian church. So our role here at Light Channel, you and I, is to have hearts saturated with divine love and yet be firm as still in upholding God's law. This is not an easy task as we have covered to perform and it certainly will not become any easier in the future. On the contrary, the day is not far distant when those who stand for the right will be classed with the de devil himself. With utmost firmness, we can go forth under God's blessing to wrest souls from the enemy's grasp. 
Well, Baron, thank you very much again for being part of this program and taking your time very imp on this very important topic. Thank you for being part of this webcast. Thank you for inviting me, Michael. Appreciate the opportunity to share my knowledge and my experiences. Thank See you. See you next time.